Hello, everyone. In the mid-1990s, a certain pastor called me, encouraging me to watch a TV expose of a televangelist who'd gotten into trouble, bad trouble, media-wise. And I knew about it, but I didn't want to watch the TV expose. I told him, no way. And he seemed disappointed. What if he's poured out his heart in deep repentance, I said. His reply was, oh, he's not repentant. You ought to watch this and see how bad he really is. And I said, no thanks. And of course, now I want to extend grace and favor to that man, hoping that that pastor has in turn re repented of that attitude. Jesus said, here's my new commandment. I'm paraphrasing it. And by this, all men will know you're my disciples. By the way you love one another as I have loved you. Those are Jesus' words. And what was his love like? That while we were still sinners, he died for us. While we were still sinners, Romans 5, 8. Right now, the church of God, the body of Christ, made up of people who have God's Holy Spirit, being led by God's Spirit, the church of God is splintered. And I don't mean just the church of God that calls himself church of God. But forget branches of the church. I mean, Jesus himself said, sure, I'm the vine, you're the branches. We're less than branches. We're splinters. We're splintered. Many cogs, church of gods, okay, refuse to recognize others as God's people or let their members attend anywhere else. What on earth? Largely because we don't offer God's grace to one another. And many of you refuse to realize there are scores of thousands who keep the Seventh-day Sabbath and God's holy days, who are not Church of God people. They're members of the Hebrew roots. At least some of them, many of them are complete Sabbath keepers, holy day keepers, and some in the Messianic groups also keep the Seventh-day Sabbath, holy days, and all of that. And many of them clearly, I've met so many of them over the years, have God's Holy Spirit, have an understanding of Scripture, where, which you can't understand without it. <clears throat> you won't offer the hand of fellowship in some cases because their services have too much praising and dancing than you like. And they say Yahweh or Jehovah or Yeshua, mostly. And some of them want nothing to do with the cogs either, the Church of God splinters, who mostly won't come together either. I think this is such nonsense Christ is not going to marry a bride made up of brethren who won't come together. The bride of Christ is one body, Christ's body. It will not have a leg over here, an arm over there, a back or a belly somewhere else. It just won't. We've got to come together. If it's doctrinal issues keeping you apart, that's fine as long as they're not uh, salvational issues. I think when we have God's spirit and have the right attitude, I think we'll, we'll, we'll very quickly come to, you know, when, when Yeshua, when Jesus tells us now about the calendar issues and about the year I died, was it 30, 31, 33? What was it? And what's my name? And what should people refer to me as? Of course, he's Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and he's my Savior, and he's my brother and my father. I call him my father. That's the name I primarily use. But as far as YHVH, I understand it means Jehovah. But whether it's Yahweh, Jehovah, or he just wants to say, call me Father. Once we're told by God the things that divide people, name of God, the holy days, the calendar is a big issue. We'll come together on those things quickly, instantly. So we've got to come together. A lot of it has to do with this sermon today. John ten sixteen. Uh, if you want a title for this sermon, it's Living and Practicing God's Grace. Extending God's grace and favor to other people. God's grace comes from God. Yeah, I know that. But at the same time, Anything God gives us, he wants us to share with others. I'll get more into that in a minute. But many refuse. Okay, John ten sixteen. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring. 
I have some more sheep that you guys don't know anything about. I have to bring them. And they will hear my voice. And there will be one flock, not a bunch of flocks, and one shepherd. Oh, we'll have other shepherds over divided, you know, not divided, but little smaller groups. But the one shepherd overall, the chief shepherd is Yeshua, as Peter said. Many refuse to fellowship with, certainly not listen to or any, uh, or have anything to do with anyone with a bad past, let alone doctrines. And now if you hear about bad past, like the minister who wanted me to watch this, this stuff on some other minister. Uh, we'll talk about that a lot today, and I speak generally. I can include myself, I suppose, but I speak generally. We've just come through Passover when we're reminded of God's grace, God's favor, God's love but also of God's big dreams and hope that he has for you and for me and everyone he's calling, regardless of our past. Please see my two sermons recently about God's grace and favor. As we children of the highest receive God's grace for all our sins, no matter how bad they were, isn't it great that God believes in what he can do in us and he Let's us start over again. He lets us ramp up. He says, hey, don't give up. I know you denied me, Peter. And I'm not going to deny you before my father. I know I said that. He would deny me. I'll deny before my father and holy angels. Peter, I see you've repented. And I'm, in fact, going to have you be one of the leaders of the church. It's okay, brother. And he puts his arm around Peter. You know, Peter was the first man that Yeshua saw. The first woman, the first person he saw was Mary of Magdala. Mary Magdalene. So anyway, he believes in us. And look what happened to Peter, who just days before was saying he didn't have anything to do with this Jesus and didn't know him. And then a few days later on Pentecost, wow, the courage, the difference. And think of this too, practically all the great leaders in the Bible were terrible sinners at one time, just like you and me. But with God's spirit and God's grace and knowing God believed in what he could do in them, I'm not saying God believed in them. God believed in God. God believed in what God could do in them they, and what they would be able to do and to be, that they would be able to be used greatly by God in spite of anything in their past. So in fact, when we read about the men and women of Hebrews 11 Hall of Fame of faith, we don't even read of any negatives. Go back and check me out on that. There are no negatives. Just their faith. One who jailed, tortured, and murdered people ended up writing much of the New Testament, for example. And then God brought a, a, a man called the Son of Encouragement into his life to give him hope and a new start to help him get walking again. Where would we be without people like this Barnabas, son of encouragement, showing up? Believing that our life story isn't finished yet, no matter how much damage we've caused, and thereby helping us experience God's grace, love, and hope in spite of our past sins. Yes, I am Philip Shields, forgiven sinner, basking in my Father's acceptance and love. I'm host of Light on the Rock, and as a forgiven sinner... You know what? I feel comfortable with you because so are you. Forgiven sinners. That's what we all are. The not so greats of the world. Remember 1 Corinthians 1, 26? But we're the ones God chose to be what he calls the first fruits. We're the early crop by his grace. So when God gives us something, he expects us to use it broadly, widely. His love, he expects us to use it and share it. His grace, he expects us to use it and extend it, use it on others. He doesn't expect us to uh, accept his grace and then say, but I want nothing to do with someone over here who I heard has, has had some horrible things, like that televangelist or, or me or someone else or you. No, that's not of God. This concept of us sharing God's grace seems to be a novel concept to those I've tested this topic on. What do you mean? Grace comes from God, not from us. Yeah, I know God's the one who dispenses grace. But he wants us showing that same spirit to each other. To accept a repentant, flawed human being. Yeah, people like you. 
people like me. He expects us to encourage them, to give hope to them, to love and be gracious to them, people who've had sins in the past. God wants us believing and conveying that belief of God himself, that God in them, God's spirit working in them, can change them, can let them be up and going again. Someone is down and bloodied and wounded by sin or by depression or by uh, setbacks in their life. You know, I, I tell people, hey, come on, we need you in the fight. Get back up. Get back up. Wounded and bloodied as you are, get back up. Some of those who fall terribly in sin will become great leaders. You watch. And look at Hebrews 11. The Davids and the Samsons and the Moseses and the Pauls, you know. I mean, so many of them. And you watch, especially if God's family gives them hope. God's family, I mean you. He wants you inspiring them, no matter what their past was. They still have a future with God rather than destroying their reputation further by spreading garbage about fellow brethren or refusing to have anything to do with them or trying to convince others to have nothing to do with them. I'm seeing that happen all over. Here and there, I have many examples. I'm not narrowing it down to one or two, and certainly not just to me or anything like that. So how do you feel about those who may start coming to your fellowship group? Are you welcoming them if they've been in jail before, uh, full of tattoos or were drunks or indigenous people uh, or, or pe people you're not used to having in your fellowships, what I'm trying to say, or you see that they have tattoos on their arms and their legs and who knows where else, where else? Will you encourage those people? The fact is even the ones who attend with you who look respectable, frankly, are also sinners, no better really. If someone in your fellowship is disfellowshipped, how encouraging are you to that person to help them feel they can come back without gossip going on? To let them know that they'll have a friend in you and a brother or sister in you. Now realize again, I'm speaking generally. It's not unusual to hear God's people who love receiving God's favor than openly rejecting it as something possible for others once they hear about their sins and they want to trash those others. God is not in that attitude. And I'm going to show you many scriptures. I refer to the way some brethren spread gossip like a like a manure spreader, an industrial strength manure spreader. You know, spreading gossip about people who you've heard have had pretty serious sins in their past, but have been repented of. Where's the grace and favor we're supposed to be practicing for cases like that? And who among us has ever been sinless? A single sin. Now, this is important. A single sin. Even if it was a harmless little white lie, and you're harmless in quotes here. No matter how grave or harmless, still required the death of the Son of God. As surely as someone coming in with a truckload of awful sins. They both had the same penalty death paid for by someone who had to die for the guy with just one little tiny sin in all his life which is not which is really nobody and someone who has a truckload full so how can any of us refuse the right hand of fellowship with anyone in the body of christ who has repented and i'm going to read to you the ones who are in this fellowship and what paul said so are you waking up to a big area that you may have some repenting to do i want to give an example Paul, previously under his Hebrew name Saul, was notorious for his brutality to new believers in Christ. Even God told him it would be hard for him to do much in Jerusalem after it was all said and done because of Paul's reputation there. But Paul repented, and Paul went on to write most of the New Testament. Paul went on to be one of the greatest leaders we've ever known, one of the greatest teachers I, I, I think he, in, my, in my books, he's the greatest apostle in my books. I know a lot of people think Peter, but I, I, Paul, I've just learned so much from him. But Paul repented, but it still took a long, long time for Jews in Jerusalem to accept him. Let's read what happens here in Acts 4, first of all. This is the beginning, this is before the story of Paul, or Saul, as his Hebrew name was. Saul, Paul, you know who I mean, same person, okay? And Joseph, or Joseph, 
who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement. Bar means son, just like Ben means son. He was a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now that's our first introduction to this man that I know of named Barnabas, whose name means son of encouragement. And uh, some say it means son of prophecy, uh, but his prophetic things were so encouraging. I'm going to encourage us all to be more like Barnabas, someone who can give hope and encouragement to others everyone wants to run away from. When God called Saul, called Saul on the road to Emmaus in Acts 9, and you know what happened. I won't repeat the whole story, the bright light being struck down off his high horse. And uh, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Me. And what did Paul say? Who are you, Lord? And the voice said, I am Jesus, Yeshua. Now, in this case, I'm going to say Yeshua because the Bible is very clear that Yeshua, Jesus, talked to Paul in Hebrew. In the two accountings later that Paul talked about, at least in one of them, he says, he spoke to me in Hebrew. So if he spoke to him in Hebrew, not Aramaic, it's a falsehood to think that they no longer spoke Hebrew in Jesus' day, or primarily Aramaic. That's a falsehood. They spoke Hebrew a lot. It says Paul spoke to the audiences in Hebrew and so on. So anyway, when Jesus talked to Paul, he says, I am Yeshua. He spoke in Hebrew, so he would have said Yeshua, because that's what it means, salvation, Savior. And I've talked about that before. So that's why I call him by the same name, his mama called him, the same name that he gave to Paul, I am Yeshua, when he spoke in Hebrew. And so in Acts 9, uh, he now is blinded, and uh, uh, Jesus says, okay, go to Damascus, and I'll tell you what to, what to do there. I'll show you what to do. And he was blind, he didn't eat, he was fasting for several days, I think it was three days or so. And then God appears to Ananias. And talks to Ananias, one of the leaders there. And he says, I'm, I need you to go talk to this guy named Saul and uh, encourage him and give, give him sight, baptize him. And Ananias says, excuse me, Lord, you may not have gotten the memo. This guy's bad. He's not our friend. He's killed people. In fact, he came up here to arrest us all, take us back down to Jerusalem in chains. And God said, so let's pick up there in Acts 9, verse 13. Acts 9, verse 13. And Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard many from many about this man, how much harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind us all who call on your name. Are you getting the story? But the Lord said to him, Go, for he's a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings and the children of Israel. I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. I mean, God saw what he wanted to do in Paul, Saul. He, he didn't see what Paul would do or could do. He saw what he could do in Saul. He says, he's my chosen vessel. He's going to do certain things I want him to do. And Ananias went his way, entered the house where Paul was, where Saul was, and laying his hands on him, the first thing he did was touch him. There's something magical about touch, something so wonderful. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the first word, Saul, who had been killing, persecuting, yes, he murdered some, some of the, he says he did, he murdered some of the disciples first word he heard from Ananias was brother. That, that really touches me. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once. He arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. And then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. That says a lot about the disciples in Damascus who were willing. They've never suffered from Paul before, but, you know, they, they immediately accepted him, it looks like. And Ananias was living God's grace. He was 
what the sermon's about. He was extending it. He was using it. I've received God's grace, he thought to himself. How can I not help this man understand that he is to receive it also? And he'll see it and understand it as he sees me extending it, practicing God's grace. And just like the other disciples in Damascus, would you have been a part of that joyful acceptance of Saul? And then later on, it talks about Paul preaching Christ. Preaching Christ. Preaching Christ. That's what he preached. That's who he preached. In Damascus until he had to flee. And then, verse 26, And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, <clears throat> he tried to join the disciples, it says, Acts 9, 26, but they were all afraid of him, didn't believe he was a disciple. Guess what happens? This nice guy whose name means son of encouragement, which is what this sermon's about, that we all should be children of encouragement. Barnabas, extending grace. Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. Barnabas took him and introduces him to the apostles. He declared, he, Barnabas declared to them how he had seen the Lord, how Saul had seen the Lord on the road and that he had spoken to him. Jesus had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he was with them in Jerusalem coming and going out. What a wonderful, wonderful story. Thank God for people like Ananias and Barnabas, whose name meant son of encouragement. You and I should be just like that. Giving people a, another life, another go at it, forgiven by God, encouraging them that they can be leaders and powerful, do powerful things even in this life. I don't care if you're a man or a woman. I mean, if you're a woman, there are things you can do that can change the course of history in some parts of the church, as some of you are doing. God bless you. Where would Paul have been without Barnabas? So Barnabas and Paul went on a missionary journey. They did well. Then later Paul took Silas. Barnabas took Mark because there had been some contention. Mark, John Mark, who happened to be Barnabas' cousin, had quit halfway through that journey, the first journey, and Paul didn't want anything to do with a quitter. Barnabas says, no, I'm going to encourage him. I'm going to show him I still believe in him, in God in him. And I want him to come. So Paul says, okay, you take Mark and I'll take Silas. And that's what happened. <clears throat> but even the story of John Mark. I've told the story before. He quit on a journey with Paul and Barnabas, like I said. Uh, and so you can read, though, when Paul writes in Colossians 4.10 and 2 Timothy 4.11, Paul saw changes in Mark. He saw value in Mark. Mark eventually teamed up with Peter and eventually wrote the gospel of Mark. What if there had been no Barnabas to say, Mark, I know you made some bad decisions. You were disappointing on that first trip, but I believe in God in you. So come on, let's get going. We've got another journey to go on. Thank God for Barnabas. Thank God for people like you if you learn it. Excuse me. <clears throat> of course, our Savior himself lived this life of extending grace to known sinners, extended to all of us, but I mean way beyond the grace on the cross. Christ absolutely forgave Peter for denying him three times, vocif vociferous, vociferously denying him three times. In John 4, he, he met with specifically a woman who had a bad reputation. If you read the verses before that, he said, we must go through Samaria. He knew who was there. And the woman who was so ashamed of herself came at noon when none of the other women or people getting water would be there. It's too hot. I drunk water from that well. It's still there. But she was a loose woman. And yet it was to this woman that Jesus revealed that he was the promised Messiah. And he stayed there two or three days. I think it was a couple of days. And many, many people believed in him because of the testimony of that woman. Another woman in Luke 7, who was not a good woman, her sins were many, Yeshua says, publicly. This woman anointed his feet with precious oil, expensive, and Jesus publicly said, her sins which are many are forgiven. And what a wonderful, you have another go at it. Leave the past behind you. Keep going, keep going, keep going. In spite of all her past. This, then there's Mary Magdalene, the crazy woman. I call her the crazy woman because she had seven demons who had been cast out of her. Luke 8, verse 2. 
seven demons. She was one of Christ's most ardent followers. She was first at the at the resurrection to see him. She was one of the last ones there at the cross and the first to see and talk to the risen Christ in spite of everything in her past. And a demon can make you do a lot of things you'd, you'd be very ashamed of later on. Not just say things, but say, do things. So there are so many, many more examples I could use, but instead of reading them all, you know what, I want to someday hear about you. And I want to read about you. I want to hear about you. How you started practicing God's grace and favor. How you let people shine through uh, using God's spirit to let them know they've been forgiven. God has a purpose for them just like Barnabas did for Paul and later on for Mark. You be that kind of person. Actually, when we wash feet at Passover, remember Jesus said, no one had bothered to wash our feet, so I, the Son of God, decided to do it. I am one of those, I am the one who's washing your feet. So you learn the lesson, not that you just serve one another, but that you be humble enough to do it. I actually say out loud to the person, and, and he says, I've washed your feet. So when, I, when I'm at Passover washing someone's foot, feet, I look up at the man, because men wash men's feet and so on. By washing your feet, I'm acknowledging our Savior has already washed your feet, and mine too. I do not, never will see you as anyone but washed. In the blood of my lamb and your lamb, no matter what I ever hear or find out about you, you are washed. And I'm acknowledging that. Okay? Don't repeat stuff about other people. Okay, I don't mean the word stuff like the Australians do, uh, but I, I mean junk. Okay? As it is. I wonder how many, what would have happened to Mary Magdalene, John Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark, the Apostle Peter, and Paul himself, had it not been for brethren who gave them hope, gave them the belief that they could end up being leaders still, no matter what. You know, I was just watching this story about General Grant in the History Channel. And that man came from very humble beginnings, but he worked alongside slaves. He didn't like slavery. But he married a wife whose father liked slaves. But not Grant. Eventually, when he had his own place and his own people, he freed them all. But my point is, he went through a period there when he had to leave home and was all by himself out in the West, that he became a drunk and had to resign from the, from, from the military. And he, he was a West Point graduate and all of that. But people believed in him, and he believed in himself too. And without Grant, I don't know that the Civil War might still be going on. So it just inspired me, too, watching that, that then when the war started, Lincoln called for those who have any experience in, in war uh, to please volunteer. And, of course, he volunteered and was reassigned again as, a, as a, a, an Army officer, later a general. You know the rest of the story. He became even president. I mean, one thing is certain. It's far easier to feel that God has covered you with his favor, with his grace. Remember, grace means favor. When God's children also cover you with God's grace. You see God's children accepting you. They don't discuss any of the sins they know about you. They want you to know they see you as cleansed and washed, redeemed and accepted. Would gladly meet with you. Gladly accept you into the body of Christ. You be that way. We're between Passover and Pentecost, as I said, as I record this. It's a good time to check your hearts. See if you believe in God's power enough to start showing God's grace to other people who feel so rejected. Because we all fail. We all fall down. Do you practice accepting people whom other people might reject for any reason? Are you practicing favor? Are you believing in what God can do in people? I keep saying it. I want you to get it. Or are you a gossip? Are you a mudslinger? Are you a gossip fertilizer, dog cow manure spreader? That's one way we practice disgracing others. So stop disgracing and start gracing, start favoring other people by being that way yourself. We'll continue here. Now, here's part of the problem. A lot of people think 
God is not all powerful. God's spirit's not all powerful. Because once a drunk, always a drunk, right? Once a certain kind of sexual sinner, always that kind or kinds. That you, you never give it up, we're told. Well, with Pentecost here, are you one who believes that God by his spirit, or do you not believe this, can totally transform anyone of any sin or sinful habit? Or do you believe that God's spirit is weak and once you're a certain type of sinner, you're always going to be? I believe God can and does transform us and other believers from any and all of our past. There are many ministers who will disagree with me, but I'm going to use the Bible, as you'll see. Are you letting people who have left their sins of 5, 10, 20, 30 years ago be allowed back in your social graces and acceptance? Or are you one of those who would never want to ever be seen with them ever again, or to attend with you, or to sit in church with you, to worship God with you? Or do you periodically disclose something you know about them? How we want people to experience, or do we want people to experience how God's grace works firsthand by the way we, God's children, treat them? Or do people, people find out about those who've fallen from grace with that term? They've fallen from grace because of your gossip. If you're doing that, God have mercy on you. Because no mercy will be shown to those not showing mercy. You're on very thin ice if you're not accepting someone God died for. Now, brethren in the church are not changing. And right now are still, as a way of life, getting drunk. As a way of life, still committing adultery or other sexual sins. Yeah, we're told not to mingle with them, not to even eat with them. Until they do repent and stop. Let's read it. But still, even then, should we be talking about them? No. 1 Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 5, the first few verses, is about this terrible, immoral person in the church that Paul was saying, you got to get out, you got to put him out. 1 Corinthians 5, verses 9 to 13. I wrote to you in my epistle, 1 Corinthians 5, 9 to 13, not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean the sexually immoral of this world or with the covetous extortioners, idolaters of this world, then you would have to go out of the world. You'd have no one you could talk to. That's what he's saying. But now I, what, I've, what I've written to you is not to keep company with anyone who's named a brother. We might add sister here. Don't keep company with a brother who is, present tense, who is, Sexually immoral. Not was. Not did some horrific things in the past. Or else you'd have to disfellowship forever King David. Who is sexually immoral. Who is covetous, greedy. Okay, Who is an idolater. Or a reviler. That means slanderer. Or gossip. Or a drunkard. Or an extortioner. That's a cheat. Don't even eat with such a person. Now, a covetous person? Have you not been a covetous person from time to time? Have you not been a slanderer or reviler from time to time? Now, if that's your habit, God says, I, I shouldn't even eat with you. But, verse 12, for what have I to do with judging those who are outside? Now, people outside are like that. It's okay to be their friend. It's okay to work beside, beside them. It's okay to go visit with them in their home and have them in your home. That's what he's saying. Do you not judge those on, who are inside, but those who are outside? God's their judge. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. So judge this guy I told you about earlier in the first few verses of chapter 5, 1 Corinthians 5. Put, put that person away. But notice the word is, is. If they're currently indulging in sin as their way of life, if someone is immoral, is a drunk, living in sin now as their way of life, then have nothing to do with them. This does not apply to people who were a certain sinful way. And besides, we all stumble in sin. We all still sometimes 
make it a present tense that we are doing some kind of sin. We stumble, we repent. He goes on to say in verse 11, 13, we can't apply that same standard to the people of the world, though. Then in the next chapter, 6, he talks about not suing each other and being willing to be cheated. Being willing to be cheated. Now, one of the translations for, in verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 5, extortioner, if someone's an extortioner, if the person's a cheat. Okay, then he goes on in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 to 11 to describe a host of terrible sins. You can take your time to look them up. I've read that many times. Sins that society tells us we can never even overcome. Like being a drunkard. Like certain sex uh, orientations or whatever that we have. You're that way, that's the way you are, is what the world says. Paul says in verse 11, such were, not such are, such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit. You were washed, set apart as holy, and declared righteous. Justified means declared righteous. By the Holy Spirit of our God. You see, even what I'm trying to say is uh, certain sins that people say, oh, once you're a certain way, that you're, you're, you're that way the rest of your life. They just don't know the power of God's Spirit. God's Spirit can change people no matter what it was. He can transform us no matter what our past sinful behavior was. Or it will transform us if we let God transform our lives. Otherwise, how could Paul say such were some of you? If someone's being transformed, please let their past stay in the past. Now, remember the terrible guy with terrible sex sins, I mean, in 1 Corinthians 5? Paul said, get him out of there. But then what happens in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, sometime later? Now he's admonishing them. Why is this guy still out there by himself? Why haven't you brought him in? Bring him in. Show him some grace, some love. Extend God's grace to him. Live it. Give him some hope. That's what his message is. <clears throat> Second Corinthians 2, verses 6 to 11. The punishment of the majority, 1 Corinthians 2, verses 6 to 11. It's sufficient for such a man, so now you should forgive and comfort him instead. Forgive and comfort this terribly immoral guy who isn't doing it anymore. Otherwise, this one may be overwhelmed by excessive grief when he has nowhere to go. <clears throat> Verse 8. Therefore, I urge you, confirm your love to him. It was for this purpose I wrote, so I may know your proven character, if you are obedient in everything. Now to whom you forgive, I do too. For what I've forgiven, if I've forgiven anything, is for you in the presence of Christ. Now listen, so that we may not be taken advantage of by Satan. He's our enemy, hey. For we are not ignorant of his devices, of his intentions. <clears throat> it's hard for someone in normal situation, to fully accept God's grace if they don't experience God's grace in their interactions with God's children, you and me. Or to put it another way, it's much easier to believe in God's grace that God covers you in all of your sins when you experience the loving, the accepting, accepting, the forgiving, the extension of God's grace coming from God's children as well towards you. It's a lot harder if you don't experience that. Believe me, I know. So keep asking yourself, are you living God's grace and favor to people God is working with? Even if they fail and they fall, they repent, they get back up, and they fail, they fall, they repent, get back up. Seventy times seven. If a person comes to you seven times in one day and says, I, I repent, we ought to forgive them, Jesus said, right? Remember that? even those who sinned horribly against you. And remember, you've sinned too. All sin, yours or anyone else's, requires the death of your Savior. And when he forgives, he forgives it all. Whether you do or not. But if you won't forgive a brother or sister, but are out there gossiping about sins, 
Your sins are the ones that won't be forgiven. Now, someone with such a past previous sins, is he done as far as God being able to use her or him? No, absolutely no. Uh, David's a great example. You're going you're gonna to read his Psalms forever. You're going to be under him in Israel as king of Israel. Yeah, look what he did. I want to ask you, what do you think of someone who commits adultery while her husband's away? And what if he, what if he has the man, the husband, murdered so that this adulterer can bury the consequences? I'm talking about David, of course, and Uriah and Bathsheba. 2 Samuel 11 and 12. You ought to go back and read 11. 2 Samuel 11 and 12. Get it fresh. David was such a man. Would you re ever read his Psalms again? Or has he disqualified himself forever? Is God done with him because of that? No, he's going to be above the apostles. The apostles will have a tribe each. But David's going to be king over all Israel. David also numbered Israel. 70,000 of his flock, his people, died because of that decision. Because he was getting a little vain about how big his army was and how powerful he was. If you're not familiar with this story, go back to 2 Samuel 24 and read that. 2 Samuel 24 or 1 Samuel 24? I think it's 2 Samuel 24. Yeah. And I, then I say 2 Samuel 11 and 12 about the story of Bathsheba. Not 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel. So what David did was really bad. But you know you still study his Psalms. You know he'll reign over Israel. So you'd forgive him because he's David. But not forgive someone else who committed sex sins and did terrible things some years ago? Televangelists and whatnot? I speak generally. I'm not speaking about anyone in particular. But my point stands. We all need God's grace. We all need to be extending it. Remember, I said, I can say it again, it's hard for someone to really accept and feel God's grace, God's love, if they don't experience God's grace and God's love in their interactions with God's children. I mean you and me. Or to put it another way, it's much easier for them to feel God's grace when they feel it coming from you. Some are so bad at not letting people have a new life that they just produce a mass gossip machine. It's just so wrong. Gossip is terrible in God's eyes. eyes. It separates friends from one another. You shouldn't listen to any of it. If you listen to it, you're condoning it. Change the subject. They'll get the point if they have God's spirit. You know, if they're starting to tell you about somebody, change the subject. Or if you're stronger than that, say, you know, I really don't care to hear it. I don't want you to ever do this again. And then give them a hug. So, they, so you forgive them as well for gossiping. But tell them, stop it. We've got to stop it. People are gossiping about various ones in various churches. And it's just plain wrong. Unless you're trying to save someone from a salvational issue. So we have to start seeing brethren also in newness of the Spirit. Are we living the lessons of Passover? Are you still looking at people the way they were in the flesh? Are you looking at them now as the way they are in the spirit? Paul addressed that as well. When you know something terrible about somebody and he's now attending in your fellowship, maybe this woman coming towards you was a terrible drunk, but having seen her, uh, having not seen her for some years, she now approaches you and you recognize it, you know she's attending now, do you instantly think, oh, I know her, she's that terrible drunkard? Even though you smile and shake her hand, or do you let that person start over with a gracious welcome that you mean? You really mean it. I bring this up because I see example after example where God's people are not so willing to extend God's favor and grace. Look at Second Corinthians 5, verses 14 to 15. Paul says, Christ died for us all because we've all sinned. 2 Corinthians 5, 14, 15, and then 16 to 19. 
Christ's love compels us since we have reached this conclusion. If one died for all, then all died. And he died for all so that we who live should no longer live for ourselves, but for the one who died. And then he goes on from there. People who won't reach out in gracious favor to someone whose sins are known and forgiven by God himself are in grave danger. It's because they don't understand we're not supposed to be looking back for our own self or for others. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 16 to 19, in the English Standard Version. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. We regard no one now according to the flesh. God's telling each of us, stop it. Stop thinking of each other the way you once were. You're repentant sinners now, children of mine. You've been washed, forgiven, redeemed, and justified. None of us has any right to question God's total forgiveness of someone else, no matter how bad the sin was. When we refuse to give the right hand of fellowship, but when we spread the details of someone's sins, it puts us in mortal danger with God himself. Verse 17, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, a great memory verse. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. He's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All of this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. This is what I meant earlier. When God gives us something, he expects us to share it. God gives you blessings, he expects you to share it. God gives you his love. He expects you to share it. God gives you his reconciliation. You were reconciled. He expects you to practice the ministry right here in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18. He gave us, you, me. That's what us means, you and me, the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ. God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Are you getting it? Are you letting someone's past be past? Are you giving the, the message of reconciliation by meeting with them, visiting with them, inviting them to be part of your fellowship? You whisperers of gossip. You who send detailed pages of trash. Whether they're church brethren, ministers, or televangelists, shame on you. For your own eternity's sake, stop. And help bring people together now, reconciling people together. Help bringing the church of God, which is in fractured splinters right now. And I don't mean just church of God people. I mean members of God's true church who have God's spirit, who are in the Hebrew Roots Movement who are in the Messianic movement, who also keep God's Sabbath, who also tithe, who also keep the holy days, who also eat, eat only the clean meats and all the things you think are so important. They do all that too. And yeah, they praise and they dance. And they say Yehovah or Yahweh or Yeshua. And you may, you cogs, you church of God people may have a certain view of prophecy that they don't or understanding of it. But let's come Together. Proverbs 16, verse 27, 28. An ungodly man, a very bad man, an ungodly man digs up evil. Someone gives you stuff, go check out so-and-so. And you go check out so-and-so. That's digging up evil. That makes you ungodly in God's eyes. Verse 28. A perverse man. I know I don't want to be ungodly. I don't want to be perverse. Do you? A perverse man sir, sir, sows strife, and a whisperer separates the best of friends. God have mercy on us when we do that. Don't be in the ungodly category. Don't be among the perverse. Do we want anything like what I've just read to apply to you and me? I sure hope not. So who are you working for? Here's the other thing I want to mention. As a believer, whom do you want to work for? For whom do you want to work? <laughs> Don't end in a preposition or like 
Winston Churchill said, said something like, uh, that's the kind of nonsense with which up I will not put. <laughs> anyway, we know we have an adversary. Satan means enemy. It means adversary. The Hebrew roots people call it Hasatan, or the Jews did too. Hasatan. Ha means the. The enemy, the adversary. How about devil? It's from the Greek word diabolos, and which sounds like the Spanish almost, diabolo, which is devil. But it means accuser, slanderer. When you tell other people's sins, you are working for the one who slanders us in the presence of God day and night. He is an accuser of the brethren day and night, Revelation 12 says. I don't want to be that. When you share other people's sins, you are working for the enemy, adversary, Satan, or Hasatan, who slanders and accuses, which is what Satan, the devil, mean, means. It's the devil, it's the enemy, who slanders and accuses, gossips. So he's the serpent of old. He's called the accuser of the brethren day and night. Don't be a part of that. And at any time you read or watch slander the other's sin or listen to it, you're standing with Satan, the accuser of the brethren against God's children, against the one who died for us all. You're standing against him also. Uh, we're between Passover and Pentecost, like I say. So I'm going to jump down here. I'm going to cut out some notes here for time's sake. <coughs> so uh, hang on. Satan comes to uh, steal, kill, and destroy, remember. And Satan, we read about him also in Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. There were two big, well-known jo jo Joshua's in the Bible, the first one who led them into the promised land. And then the second Joshua helped lead them back into the promised land from captivity. But the second Joshua had some sins, apparently. And so Zechariah 3, verses 1 to 5, And then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord. Now usually when you have the angel of the Lord, it means the one we now know as Jesus Christ or Yeshua HaMashiach. Yeshua HaMashiach. Anyway, that means Jesus Christ. Okay, The Savior the Messiah, okay, the anointed one. And Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, Yehovah, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who's chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? We pulled him out just in time. Now, Satan, you get out of here, okay? Now, Joshua was clothed with filthy garments, kind of like the prodigal son. And was standing before the angel, the angel of the Lord. And then he, the angel of the Lord, answered and spoke these things to, to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him, and then to him he said, Look, I've removed your iniquity from you. The filthy garments, pictures iniquity, pictures lawlessness and sin. And I will clothe you with rich robes. That's what happens to all of us. When we repent of our sins, he takes away our sins and he gives us the, his own righteousness as a robe, it says in Isaiah. His own righteousness. And I said, let them put, and, and then I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. And so they put a clean turban on his head and they put the clothes on him and the angel of the Lord stood by. Who do you want to be working for? The angel of the Lord or for Hasatan, the Satan, the devil, the accuser? Remember it says right here, that this this Satan standing at his right hand, Zechariah, Zechariah 3, verse 1, to oppose him. And Jesus Christ said, Yehovah rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who's chosen Israel, rebu Jerusalem, rebuke you. And he was in filthy garments, but God said, I'm not done using this guy. I know he's, he's like a piece of burning wood in a fire, but we got him out in time, and we're going to make good use of him. That's God's grace. That's God's love. And he wants you and me extending that grace and his love. He really does. So whose side do you want to be representing? All of us probably some have some repenting to do. Uh, let's be more like a Barnabas. Stop fighting God's grace. Start living and demonstrating God's grace. 
Start practicing God's favor with other people who can really use the uplift and the encouragement. Stop being a slanderer, listening or reading any slander. I apply, I apply this to the tabloids too. Just stop. Just stop. Don't pick up a tabloid. That's the attitude of Satan. Accusers. Gossips. Don't be part of that. Praise the Lord. Praise our Father. And I hope all of you who hear this will stop working for the adversary, Satan, who accuses the brethren. Get on the right team. Encourage those who have been down and out. Let them know there's a future still for them. Someone's done that for me from time to time. And it really has made all the difference. Those of you who believed in me when I was down and out. Thank you. Thank you so much. I love you so much for it. Get on the right team, exercising hope and grace, love and favor. Maybe even especially to God's children who have sinned so badly in the past. Encourage them that they have a hope and future. Extend God's grace. May our fabulous Father bless you greatly for showing others through your actions that you are extending to them, showing them the grace and favor of our God. Isn't that amazing? We have that opportunity. He, he likes sharing his stuff with us. He really is this good stuff with us. Father in heaven, we come to you. We just ask you now for dismissal. And Father, just help us to stop uh, listening to gossip. Stop dividing. Stop refusing to meet with your other children in other splinter groups of Church of God or in the Hebrew roots or in the Messianic groups. And not all of them are your people. I know that. You know that. But we know that within these groups are people being led by your Spirit. Help us learn how we can encourage one another. Help us believe that we ourselves can become wonderful, powerful leaders in your kingdom if we submit to you and your way and come out of sin and refuse to have anything to do with Satan and his way. We want to work for you, Father. Yeshua, Jesus, my Savior. Jesus, show your love in us. Live in us. Let our life be really your life. May you be our life. We dismiss now and we ask your blessing and protection. And God, right now, there's been this horrific shooting in Texas. Oh, God. Be with those mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters. What an awful thing. And the people who bullied the guy who did all this all his life, he had a lisp and a stutter and they bullied him. And he didn't really have a family life. Oh God in heaven, have mercy on us all. Let us bring this country to family, to God, to you, to love. But be with those people in Texas. Father in heaven, send, you, send Jesus back quickly. Send him back quickly. And please, I pray if there's any way that you can help enough of your people repent, turn from our wicked ways and have mercy on our land and change the course of even your own prophecies like you did with Nineveh, like you did to Ahab personally, and like you did to Manasseh personally, and to Hezekiah personally. Oh, God in heaven, have mercy on us. As we prepare for the awful things coming, bless those who are seeking you. In Jesus' name, we thank you and we praise you. And again, bless and be with all those Hispanics and others who've lost their loved ones. A piece of them has died. We love them too, Father. Jesus' mighty name.